first drifted alarmingly in the bedding was, you know, fancy in the morning it continued to drift. It was laid on the on the exchanges to, to lose. It was something you'd see in a, in a Dick Francis novel, Charles Bobbins. The ground is soft, it's not, it's oh, not it's heavy. Soft on time is the It is heavy. Okay. Huge warm welcome to the Bar Stewards Inquiry Sunday Sermon, where we're going to be discussing all things Dubai, amongst other hot topics, and a little bit of chit-chat. We're not all going to be negative on this week's year. Some people think, oh, we're a little bit negative all the time and slagging people off. Too damn right we are. And joining me tonight to chew the fat, as always, are my two favourite counterparts, Jonas Lang and Law Malvo. Good evening, chaps. Good evening. And it's not seven quid. This is free. Tell them yes. it's free. Yes, you, you are getting amazing value for money listening to this on a really boring Sunday night. You don't have to watch the worker arties out in force with the England-Ukraine game. You can sit back and listen to us with a gin and tonic. Maybe also, for a night's entertainment, John's told me to watch a film called Free Fire. He says he had him absolutely howling the other night. Didn't, didn't you, John? Honestly, it's the funniest film I've seen in years. Yeah, absolutely yeah. hilarious. And I can rec I can recommend to back John's uh, selection up. Maybe watch some earwax removal on YouTube and some yeah. and some rat busting where the, the guy goes out with his uh, uh, <coughs> night night vision and starts shooting rats willingly on a farm. Now that's compelling I've, viewing. I've got one as well. Our listeners might want to check out. It's called European Cum Bath Volume Seven. Really good. <laughs> I don't know what it's about. It's just been recommended, but it sounds intriguing. Well, this is it. You know, we're not three minutes into the show, and um, we've we've just gone completely off topic as always. No like. subscribers now. <laughs> yes, yes. No one paying the se- the seven pounds. If you're wondering what we're going on, on about, by the way, with the with the seven pound subscription, um, it's via a site called Patreon, and all they do is host the content that we provide. And take a, a commission for doing that. They, they run all the queries. They, they take your money, pass it on to us. Bar stewards, gravy train hashtag. And for your seven quid, you're wondering, well, what do I have to pay seven quid? You don't, because the Friday show and the Sunday sermons will always remain free. However, from Wednesday of this week, you can take part in Bar Stewards Extra, which will contain me, myself, Lord Malvo, John Lang, all the Bar Stewards contributors literally giving their all in state-of-the-art articles, the launch of Barstures TV. You'll have interaction with us on, on some live shows. What is not to like for all this? And we've got some brilliant articles going up on Wednesday. Jack's done one on the Thousand Guineas. John's already done a great article. Uh, I'll be putting some stuff up there amongst Andy Richmond and others. So don't miss out. Uh, Barstures Patreon, you can click on the link on SoundCloud and YouTube that will be sort of around the video area. And so that's it. You get going and it, we're worth a pint, a, a Cheltenham Festival pint of Guinness. Wouldn't you say, chaps, that's amazing value for money? Remarkable. Um, we're, we're desperately underpriced. Indeed we are. And OK, we'll start the show then after our promo and what to do on a Sunday evening if, you, if you're bored of listening to us. Um Right, we're going to look at Dubai from yesterday, obviously a, a few talking points. And um, the first racing question I wanted to look at, uh, John, was the staying affair there, the, the, the Gold Cup, the two-mile race won by Broom. I, we had a Bastion's exclusive, but old, the Irish Harry Potter has absolutely destroyed us by 20 minutes before we were due to record. He's announced that Kiprios is unlikely to run in the uh, in the Ascot Gold Cup. And uh, we had this as a... As a as an exclusive, and we're hoping we're going to release it tomorrow, so we'd look all rather good by saying that Kiprios is unlikely to run in this year's Ascot Gold Cup after a setback with Coolmore favouring an autumn campaign. So, with that in mind, I was I was going to go all anti-post for listeners. And uh, John, what was not to like about Broom? There was nothing not to like about Broom. I mean, he's always threatened to be a really good horse, and this might prove to be his forte a couple of years. May say even person or something. Yeah, I mean, that was as good a Gold Cup trial as you would have wanted to say, really, wouldn't it? I think so. Because if you look how strong he was, he, he looked odds against to, to cut back Siskani with just over a furlong and a, and a bit to run. <coughs> And you're thinking, well, he's going to do well to, to pick that up now after that's that's pinched the run. And he and he just absolutely got after him. And, and we've seen this before with 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 
Coolmore with Yates and you know and Yates was a good mile and a half horse but he just liked that special pizzazz at a mile and a half and as soon as the up to him trip to the Ascot trip you know he was just about unbeatable uh, uh, over two and a half miles and that's that's where Broom could actually end up so if Kiprios out I, I think Broom goes from strength to strength over this trip I mean subjectivist ran well to say you know he's been off the track a long time but we can't have the kilt restoring this back to its best can we John? Well, no, he'll never come back to his best, will really. he? I mean, he was, he was too seriously injured. To me, would suggest that's as good as that arse is going to be now. Yeah, I mean, Broom was Broom was twelve and ten to one before, obviously, the Kiprios announcement just just happened just before we went on air, which is a shame because that's what me and John were going to tell you to do to lump on Broom. I could see Broom now being about four or five to one for the race. Uh, I'd consider a bet. At around five to one, I think, because when you look at the Gold Cup field, John, you've got Moho Star, which was second in it, a good second in it last year, held up off the pace, which you know didn't necessarily suit. And but he's been off the track since the Gold Cup, and that that's got to be a massive worry, hasn't it? Oh, totally. I mean, the base goal was out that said the Gold Cup could have absolutely emptied the arse out, you know. So you're guessing. I mean, if I had to punt something else out of that race yesterday for the Gold Cup and maybe have a look at El Habib. I think that one's still open to some improvement and I thought that one was keeping on our eight in the fashion of ours that get another half mile. Yeah, that's what Jack put up on the Friday show and uh, def- definitely was was very eye-catching. But yeah, I, I think, John, I, I do think Broom improves. I, I think for some reason Broom has got that touch of class over over this extra distance where he's not taken out of his comfort zone or he's not asked to make the running over a mile and a half or yeah. you know it, i think you could just settle him like they did at maidan and i and it just reminded me of a sort of a of a yates kind of performance as he just powered in, in the closing stages very unexposed so me and john are big broom fans if you have a look at the antipost markets you might be able to pinch something if a lazy bookmaker's not changed the prices yet you might be able to go yeah. in tonight and steal some anyway we're going to move on to the stairs race the al quaz sprint um it's not something that we, we're bouncing about well i'm not bouncing about but i did think john there was a, a, an advantage possibly drawn low yes maybe Throws a bit of merit on uh, site, uh, site, site, success. site success. Yeah, Ryan, Ryan Moore's. I mean, he, he's, he's been campaigned solely in, in the Far East. And this this is like a rare venture out the Far East, uh, Hong Kong, etc. Would, would this be one to come to Westcott? Well, I thought this would be interesting if they chose to do so. Because... Like with that in mind, you can re- seriously uprate his performance. I feel, and I think he is a he is a contender if they decide to to send him to Ascot. And so it'd be interesting with sight success. That was the one I picked out of the race anyway. Um, it just seemed to be a low bias in that. The Japs, John, as we mentioned on Friday, they came with tackle and carrots and lots of special feed, and they ended up with the first four room in the UAE Derby. The Japs, John, seem to have the uh, in recent years as well they, they seem to have the upper hand out here in the desert yes i don't know what to make of it to be honest because i'm not terribly au fair with the japanese racing saying um, it's something i'm gonna have to become a lot more familiar with i think given the way i was starting to make an impact on international races i worry a bit more to start winning at ascot i suppose yeah i mean the breeding program suggests that 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 they, they've, they've obviously stolen a few sires off us, but their own breeding program seems to be around producing horses that do very well at sort of like races o- over a mile and beyond, you know, like the 10 and 12 furlong distances yeah. the Japanese seem to be excelling at. Um, anyway, we'll come on to the Japs again later, but we'll cover their, um, Lord North, the Dubai turf over nine furlongs. Lord North, uh, three wins now in the race cracking horse this I mean you know nothing not to like about him um, but the one horse I want to take out the race and I think this would be a leading candidate for the Prince of Wales at Ascot if they decide to come over is Dan on Beluga I thought that was the unlucky horse in the race over an extra furlong the 10 I thought that would have definitely obviously excelled I mean he's raced at a mile and two and a mile and four in Japan and he was only a length and a quarter behind Equinox uh, back in October. So 
if they if ask got you know do what they normally do and try and persuade like world challengers rather than just concentrating on Wesley drug Baron Ward all the time, um, I just think Danon uh, Baluja would be a a very very strong candidate for a Prince of Wales job. Yeah, you couldn't really hold, could you? Definitely. I mean, that was a as promising a trial as you'd say, really. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll go to the Shima, which was obviously the big talking point here by a lot of the media. However, we do like to think a little bit differently on Barstool, not to be contrary. But, John, I get the thing about Equinox. I was surprised they made the running because we made the point on the Friday show that Equinox would be dropped out and that would be a disadvantage. And they they just made the running and, and surprised me. And whilst it was impressive, I've no doubt it was, and yeah, you know, don't take anything away from the performance. However, for me, Westover caught my eye far more than the winner. Yeah, he's run a perfectly all right first race of the season, I would have thought. Um, he's run on well, he's seen the race. I, I wasn't over enamoured with his demeanour before the race, so he surprised me how well he settled, really. Yeah, there wasn't a lot not to like. It wouldn't have been my pick of a race to go for first time up with him after his shenanigans last year at Ascot. I'd have set him off something, something a little bit quieter and maybe in Yobbly Spring, right? I think there's a growth ray there on Greenham Day. Um, but, yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a good start to his season. Are you, are you a bit surprised at Rafe Ralph's choice of jockey and Ryan Moore? <clears throat> yeah, because he's never going to be available, is he? You know, surely again, the the mess about with Colin Keane, the jock Hornby off, um, the the, the train driver, uh, for for the, the head waiter, and then and then now Ryan Moore, it doesn't see right. What I know, I think Beckett's done brilliant to get this horse back because yeah. he's clearly back. His demeanour was a bit different to what it was. In I mean, remember the King George? He'd gone in the King George, boiled over, yeah. and then the arc. It was just never going to happen. Never going to happen on that ground. And but then, but then, like you say, that to me was was a brilliant run. And I think he's he's probably right back now, where he's going to be a a serious contender for a lot of major Group Ones this summer. So I'm not dissing the performance of Equinox, but the seven to one favourite quote for the Ark already. The Japs will probably make it twos on on the day on their turf. But 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 for me the. Can he do it in a wet uh, in a wet autumn? I don't think Equinox will go on the on the slop, John. If it's slopping you, doesn't look the tape, does he? But depends what carrots are put in, I suppose. <laughs> mm. Well, this this is it. And c- coming on to this, the second the second Dubai World Cup won by Japan. The last time they won it was 2011, um, but this year they, they they won it very impressively with Ush Bartizoro. That beat Algiers. I thought Algiers was a bit unlucky because the the speed the speed of the race was was suicidal. Um, we got country grammar right, didn't we, on the Friday? Because we said that yes. we thought he'd struggled, and that, and that went off a well back favourite. And we said he'd struggle from that draw because he hasn't got the pace yeah. to, to to get a nice position. It never worked out for country grammar. But Algiers had the pace. He, he sort of hit the front, I thought, probably too soon. But James Doyle probably wouldn't have known how quick they'd gone. And he, and he got basically powered past by the carrots in the closing stages for, uh, for, for, for the Japs, John. They've certainly got the right feed, haven't they? Well, you, you, wouldn't, you, <laughs> you wouldn't worry if they were uh, increasing the feed bill if you were an owner, would you? No. no. I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think these sort of questions have to be asked because... Is it because the Japanese are getting the breeding program right? Is it because of carrots? Is it is it a combination of both? These are the questions I think that they need asking in 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 in, in the wider thing, really. Because let's let, let's be fair, who would want the Japanese coming over to the UK? <laughs> I bet you our trainers wouldn't. I mean, you 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 wouldn't want to like a Prince of Wales like with sort of three or four uh, Japanese contenders, would you? Maybe hairy, isn't it? I dare say the Barbarian Baron would be shitting it a bit if he runs his derby winner in. 
Yeah, or, or or Bay Bridge, for example, you know, like that kind of thing. That, that they're ripe for the taking if 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 the Japs come over in force at the Royal Meeting this summer. But again, it's interesting posing questions. But the Japs have to be taken seriously now on the world stage, definitely for sure. They they, they certainly they've certainly got the tackle out there in Dubai. They were taken pretty seriously on the world stage in the early nineteen forties, like. Yeah. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that because they they crashed machines into things and just and, deci- uh, and, and decided to blow things up, building bridges and things, didn't it? Yeah, they've, they've, uh, they're returning to form of past glories. Yeah. So, so 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 the thing for me though, what I take from the meeting is there's definitely carrots going on because they're beating the sandal wearers in their own backyard. And I, this is this is you know he needs keeping an eye on this because you know we all know that getting back to the mid seventies aren't we best chemist wins. It, I think so. The, you know the, I've I, you know I, want, I don't want to like say for sure, but there's got there's definitely smelling evidence that this is definitely surfacing from the Japanese. Um, so coming on to one disappointing performance, uh, going back to the Dubai turf, John. Uh, I was a bit disappointed with real world fishing, finishing effort. He a stinking mess, didn't he, really? There was no excuse, as far as I could say. No. He'd had, he had his prep. I'd, I'd worry about his future, to be honest, after that. Was it a mistake, then, taking his bollocks off? Well, they can't throw him back on, so... <laughs> <laughs> you can nowadays, John. In, in the human world, like? you, you uh, can now. You do what you want. You it's know. too late now. Um, <laughs> you'd, you'd worry, wouldn't you? He, he may be feeling that fresh air down there and resenting it. It's not. It's not looking good, is it? It's not. It's not at all. Um, so going forwards, is real world's a, a, a big no for us. Could see the end and could could finish. Say bin that the 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 radiator, the chain to the radiator merchant might turn round and. Um, He's going to need a bigger radiator, shall he? <laughs> He'll be sat yeah. with a tifa, won't he? <laughs> if, 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 if the gaps keep wiping the floor with him, the apple will be at the, at the other end as well. Yeah, the, 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 old, the old Dubai millions going to the to the uh, land of the sun. Yeah, yeah. They'll well. all be under Teddy Beckett's carpet, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell you. He's the chief carpet brusher. He's old Teddy Beckett at the National Stud shenanigans went off there last year. That's gone. To, to get that totally quiet, that's, you know, I, I had investigative journalists on at that point from the from the Telegraph all sorts, like asking me stuff what I knew. And I only knew what someone had told me off the cuff. And But they, they'd apparently been following the case for yonks at the National Stud. You know, the naughty shenanigans and the bent goings on and, you know, but that old Teddy Beckett was brought in and he's done a right job, John. Rishi Soon actually get all the Teddy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just, I mean, it's like old party gate and everything like that. I mean, under, ah, Teddy yeah. the sort. Teddy get, the sort. Get of get that back out. in his Teddy was chairman. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, it's a masterful performance from the former uh, head honcho of Judmont. Uh, so fair play to Mr. Beckett there for uh, just, Covering everything up. Right, we'll move on from Dubai. We hope you had a good weekend anyway. If you back the Japs, you're in you're in Clover. Shame about the Kipriot bombshell that is now public domain knowledge. Right, first first sort of topic I wanted to come on, chaps, is bookmakers' early prices. Now, I've noticed a shift in terms of like like the Cheltenham non runner no bet. It, it happened last year. Where you know they went non runner no bet early, and the prices mostly could get much bigger on the day. So, so, so this is this is their tactics, and I th- I feel they've extended that into the daily markets. And I say this because, and I'll be honest here, you know everyone holds our hands up when we're not producing or doing. But in 2023, I'm rarely beating Betfair SP if you like, or bet the the show prices. And I think there's a reason for that. We all get trapped into things that, well, you know, it's still a decent price. It's gone from nine to two to seven or two overnight, but it's still a decent price at seven or two, which a lot of time I do think because usually I've got it priced at five to two, so I'll still happily play at seven or two. However, this is for me bookmaker tactics where they're smashing the the Twitter tipsters, the the Bet three six five multi account merchants with the good form, but people behind them, Winky, 
um, are, are smashing them in overnight. And they're literally overreacted, if you like. The software that they use overreacts. <clears throat> it forces the pricing too short. And then the market ends up correcting itself by sort of, I would say, midday onwards. I mean, we saw this as a classic case, didn't we, Chris and John, with Conquistador yeah. in the was it four or five at Lincoln. Four or five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was it was it was backed in from sort of set, and it wasn't me because it was collapsing on the show while we recorded. It was collapsing, yeah. and um, it went from seven or two to six to four at sort of eight forty-five a.m. Yeah. By the, by the time. Like early afternoon, it's it's like out to four to one, seven to two, four to one, and it's six point six, six point eight yeah. on the shirts. Now Man. it makes it makes you feel you're wrong, but I want yeah. to ask your opinion on this, the pair here. Uh, do you think that Betfair is the probably the best guide anymore in terms of a horse's chance? Have Betfair got rid of customers off the exchange, and obviously the collective? Is now operating elsewhere, so the the the, the betfair pricing mechanism is no longer the force it was in terms of accuracy. Secondly, you know, the, how, do you think the bookmakers' tactics have changed to quash the markets in the morning, so that there's literally no value for punters waking up on a morning, right nine o'clock? I'll put my lucky fifteen or I'll have my bets because the overnight tipsters or the the sort of bet three six five sharks um, have took all the prices. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. There's no doubt that that, uh, and it's not an original point, but the Betfair market isn't as anywhere near as good as it once was. I think we all accept that. I mean, a few years back, it was sort of four or five minutes before the off. It was dynamite, wasn't it? You know, it was absolutely spot on. But you know, I messaged you with that Conquistador. I mean, that hadn't just lost a leg in the market; that had lost two legs. So you'd either you'd either think that. It was a non-trier, well, unlikely, you know, it's a, it was a reasonable contest to win. Or you'd think that somebody knew something about that horse's physical well-being, because it wasn't just a bit of a slide, was it? I mean, it was, they couldn't give it away. And yet, and yet, that's not the first time we've seen, I mean, the day before, I think it was a race at Dundalk, where horse was sort of five to two in the morning, and then, you know, just drifted like the Contiki. So, 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 I, so I do, I do think the removal of some of the, you know, the smarter people from the Betfair um, pool, if you like, is, is having now having an effect on how smart that market is. Um, and with regard to your, your your sort of suggestion that the, the, the overnight markets are, are you know, the value's being quashed, I think that's right. I really do. I think, you know, bookmakers have cottoned on to that now. And I, I think I've seen myself, you're better off almost at Betfair SP betting those blindly, aren't you, what you fancy? Because they, they, they drift like anything. This year, I mean, I've looked at the bets I've had. You know, most of the time, I'd be better off going on Betfair SP. Well, the, the, that that racing question on Friday at Dundalk was yeah. uh, Sea Chariot at, Dun, at Dun, yeah. Dundalk, and it, I asked for two to one in the morning, and got the two to one. I was happy with my price, no problem. Uh, it's gone off six point two on the machine, um, and it's pissed up. And you're just watching disbelief, like because it it, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. It just it just doesn't add up. There's something weird, and and you know normally I, I'm saying I'm wrong, I, I, and I do because I'll yeah. just say well, well I must be wrong. It's a non-jigger. It's a non-jigger. You think oh well, it's a maid and it's secret that they've got another day in mind. That's what you'd normally conclude, wouldn't you, by that kind of drift? I would, but this is happening more often. Yeah. Where I'm back in, I'm still back in. The, the the amount of winners I should be, yes. especially looking at my spreadsheets, I'm I'm back in the same amount of winners as I should be on my assessments. However, however, I am taking prices now at, at like sort of nine nine thirty a.m. thinking I'm being smart, yeah. thinking I'm going to beat Betfair SP, You're and not. normally I, I class myself as a mug because yeah, well I'm I'm a complete turby if I'm not beating like the market. And don't, that, and don't you think, Lee, sorry to cut across, that when those circumstances, when those those drifts are so pronounced, you almost don't want them to win, do you? Because you're thinking about what, what you've lost out as a result. You know, you're grand at two to one. Now you're looking at whatever it's 6.9. You're thinking, oh, almost thinking, I hope this gets fucking beat. Because you, you, yeah, you, you get your two grand, you think, oh, yeah, look what you could have won. Jim Bowen style, isn't well, it? Well, well, look at the difference. I mean, if I have the thousand pounds at Betfair SP, yeah. my returns are six thousand two hundred. My returns are three thousand, so it's cost me mm. three thousand uh, two hundred pounds mm. in terms of, uh, and that that is enough to send any. I, I should be going skin, yeah. but I'm not. 
that that that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so so basically, there's something wrong. Some there's something doesn't add up, and whether whether that's the markets that. Like I said, don't reflect the accurate price. Are, are people getting on in India? Are people using WhatsApp books in force now, and the money's just not finding its way back to you know to to the exchange? I.e., because Betfair Exchange themselves have acknowledged that I mean it's, it's twenty or thirty percent down uh, week by week over the years because people simply uh, have lost their account. So if you've lost twenty or thirty percent in the market, and bear in mind, I'd like to bet you, Chris. That twenty or thirty percent of uh, of those uh, people that have, have lost their account, a large proportion of them will be sharps. Yes, absolutely. So you're out of the gene pool. You're taking thirty percent of the brightest and best. So you know you're, you're kind of diluting the quality of that market, aren't you? By by ensuring that those people are not, you know, their their opinions aren't reflected in that market. So I think there's something in that. Obviously, you need a bigger sample size, but. You know, lately it does seem to be that there's something not quite right at all with it. Yeah, odd, odd indeed. Mm. John, John, have you? What, what's your thoughts on all this? Do you, I mean, do you agree with what's being said? Do, do, do you think it's just maybe just a, a small bit of variance in terms of well, it's it's just happening for now? But I don't know. I've noticed something different. But I, I would be able to make more pertinent comment when I've been more active in the markets once the flat's up and running. I see what you mean, yeah, because obviously you don't you don't uh, go mad uh, with the old twig hopping, but it's certainly one. What I'd like to know what you think that's, that's listening in. You know, I, am I am I just talking because it's my own sort of variance? Um, you know, I, am I am I am I probably yeah, like overthinking this? But it, I, I'm not really beating Betfair SP, which either means I'm losing the plot and I'm not as good as I think I am or I thought I was. Or, or you know, I've lost my edge or whatever. Because you, let's let's be right here. You know that the, if you if you are taking under the odds constantly, I'm going to go skin. That's a fact. You know that that's a, that's a fact of the game since the dawn of time. You have to be getting the odds. I, ends bookmakers they like to lay a price under the odds. That's what Ben Keith says. People like that. Jeff Banks they like to lay a bet that's basically bigger elsewhere. And they'll lay a good bet if, as long as you're taking under the odds, they feel like they've won. Just like we all feel like we've won when we've taken five to two, it's five to four, and we're sat feeling jolly good about ourselves even before the race has run. So it's it's that kind of thing that I, I don't know. Maybe that's it. So, but listeners, I would appreciate your opinion on this because obviously it's difficult when you live in your own bubble and you're doing your own thing and you think you're right and you you think no, I'm right here, and then. But then I'm not beating prices. So if I'm not beating prices, it could just be that my strategy is wrong in terms of going in in the morning. Should I just play Betfair shows, shows from now on? You know, who knows? I mean, I mean, I don't want to be a know-all on this topic because I, I might not know the markets as well as some listeners out there that know it better than me. So anyway, get in touch uh, with your opinion on, on taking a price. When's the right time to do it? Obviously, we can't get it overnight, but there we are. Okay, right. The um, the white paper is coming coming out on the seventeenth of April, uh, which obviously the the gambling reviewers this show's covered constantly for sort of fifteen sixteen months. And interestingly, this week Tony Calvin uh, got in touch with um, me, John, and Chris to to go over some ideas on how we could improve the uh, quality of betting output on mainstream TV channels. So I, I wrote Tony a response in terms of what I I felt we could would would would, would improve, and chaps, I mean, John, did did you watch much of ITV racing? I didn't, to be honest. No, I uh, I'm trying to give it a wide berth, to be honest. I'm finding myself getting too annoyed with it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the usual thing. But uh, TC apparently says it was apparently better yesterday again. Um, I never. But, have a the, the betting content. Uh, Chris, did you watch ITV racing yesterday? I, I did. Intermittently, I was making a buff bourguignon, right, which was you, <laughs> and it gave me the most horrific gut sake I've ever had in my life. Nothing wrong with the ingredients, but I think I just had so much meat yesterday. I think I might have poisoned myself. So, uh, but, but but in between trips to the toilet and the kitchen, I did see it, and I would agree with Tony. It was a little bit better. You know, there was a little bit more insight, but it's still a long way 
away from being, you know, I think what, what we suggested punters would benefit from. Mm. Yeah, well, so anyway, so responding to sort of like TC, I, I basically sent him um, a document that what that I thought I thought I'd thought I'd, I'd I'd cover it quite well, and I, I sort of thought that if they could, they could cover the exchanges probably a bit more um, in terms of you know like like they could report there's been big big volumes matched, like for example Conquistador. Saturday, nothing would have been mentioned on that. No, you know, or just as an example, and and it's like it's interesting for punters to, to learn of these things. You could you could you could have you could have get get them in touch with professionals, uh, what they're doing on the race. What have you done? Have you have, have you bet on this race? Yes, we've had a, I've had a big bet on such and such. It's just interesting because you can call that the sharp money, a bit like McCreek used to. It's no good now, Chris, is it? Having them wandering around the ring. No, when no. when there's nothing going on. Yeah, no, it's nonsense. I mean, you know, if you want to replicate that concept, you know, McCruick and, and Tanya, uh, where is the... Where <laughs> Email is the, the female. Yeah, yeah, in the bedding ring. I don't know what the bedding ring is. I think something at Corpse where they do some discount beds. But in the bedding ring where she used to sort of prowl around, you know, it was legitimate because that's where the money was, you know, the bookmakers, you know, it was busy. But the equivalent now is, is you know, sort of notwithstanding the comments we made earlier, you know, it's the exchanges. So you, you might almost want to have maybe someone sort of sitting in the Betfair offices, you know, talking to the trader, talking to, to people that, you know, where's the money going? Why are horses drifting? You know, which horses are shortening significantly? Because that's not what you're getting with the terrestrial and the, um, you know, and, and, the, and the satellite coverage. Yeah, it's, I mean, so... As well as that, then, so we've got the exchange, we've got the pros. They could, they could, they could also go to the uh, big industry. They could go to Denise, Entain, Flutter, and I'm sure their representative could come from there and say, "People love a bet, run, bet runner up, don't they? They love. Oh, if this wins, the uh, a granny from Walsall will win two hundred and thirty-seven thousand, you know, and just things like that. More of that. More of you know, like real time, like pain and pleasure you know pe people actually enjoy other people's <laughs> pain <laughs> <laughs> they do they, do. they want it be they want it be they want it all yeah, the german they, expression isn't it schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Yeah. schadenfreude is the word yeah and you do you do you do want to see him get fucked I, I don't, i'm glad it's yeah. not just me i don't give a shit with a margarine <laughs> from, from bolstover it's got a life-changing amount fuck her i want to you know i want to be in the rock i, I want to bet my winner for 50p it's <laughs> always better if you get great, isn't it? I, yeah. I mean, I mean, you could. I mean, it's like, yeah, when, when they announce that, they, they sort of get beat like a short head or something. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like, I'll guarantee you. Not, I, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a figure on this. Eighty percent of punters out there are laughing. Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> oh, what, what was that? that yeah. I, you remember that Agnes Haddock? Yeah. All that money. Agnes yeah. Haddock. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was in the Daisy Channel Pro race, and she, she was on the following week because she, she won an absolute pile of money for yeah. about 30 yeah. bob. Yeah. And yeah. honest to God, I could, I could have just put a pillow over her face and smothered it. I, I uh, think her husband did, didn't he? Got the money, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be down to fucking courts the following afternoon, get a nice big pillow. We're going to have you know, a nice sleep, dear. You'll be worn out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. John and the buried are up moors, up moors, I think. Um, you know, we're side. We're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 carefully, you know, foxy dig them up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're terrible. Yeah. Listeners, we're absolutely terrible. That's what you like, though. You like us being terrible. We don't condone domestic violence or murder. Just put that in there. We, we yeah, we, we do. Yeah, the hash. Yeah, with the asterisk. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, the dis, 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 disclaimer. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, so for example, as well with with the betting coverage, I, men I mentioned to TC about that they don't do enough on uh, drifters. A lot of punters sit at home, and it's like, and we know horses drift. We've just talked about it on uh, earlier on in the show about horses drift and win. It's not a problem, but ge genuinely, I think the problem is it will often present. A very awkward follow-up after a race. Yeah. Because if you're going to do it properly, you'd say this one's drifting alarmingly. And then when it inevitably runs like a piece of shit, 
you need to speak to somebody, don't you, really, to follow it up. You do. Uh, I mean, straight you, up. You know, know what happened with Barney Curley when the chair <laughs> Well, well, I actually yeah. put that in the article to, to, to TC. Yeah. I said, I said, have they got scared since did Curly set the precedent for journalists to go? We ain't going to go there, <clears throat> like 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 with yeah. tra- trainers and and jockeys and owners. And Curly and Al is going to tell them to fuck off, aren't they? You know, I mean that's the thing. Yeah. But does, doesn't that make great telly? Yes. But, oh, yeah. but, <laughs> but the people on the receiving it don't actually like it at the time. I mean, it was very very uncomfortable from a critic and Lou Curry, wasn't it? it, it, it it was. I mean, he was sort of takeout merchants, but you know, and obviously in retrospect, you'd want him to say, "Well, okay, yeah, we're we're doing work for a salary. What the fuck have you ever given to uh, to racing Barnley? He's the biggest takeout merchant. Horses run for his benefit. Owners kept in the dark. I mean, you know, that's the definition of a takeout merchant. But of course, because he was quite aggressive and he was loud, everybody curled up, didn't they? Well, if if you read Barney's book, I mean, I mean, one of the one of my favorite favorite pieces of it. Chris, the, 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 this would be you, right? So his, fa- his father trained greyhounds. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he said, give it the powder, in other words, to make it run yeah. shit. And it yeah. was like 7-1. Yeah. So he didn't he didn't give it the powder and had 100 quid on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his, fa- his father says, what? did you did you give it the powder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah I don't know what's yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to the drawing board. Anyway, I'm off out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, speaking of which, uh, obviously uh, there was another sort of bird of contention this week when Quinlan jumped uh, at Sedgefield. Now I was only I was doing it as a wind up really, but but it, it I think it was more embarrassing for the jockey rather than than anything the untoward. Because yeah. if I think about it, Chris, if, if if we were doing something like really bad. Yeah. And, we, and we were going to do a Graham Bradley uh, or something yeah. like that. You'd yeah. have done it down the back straight. Yeah, but you, you, wouldn't you, get, you wouldn't get 101 for that, though, would you? You'd get no. the 101 when it's jumped the last. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And, and I'll say something else. If it wasn't the owner, it, yeah. uh, the back pouch, you know, like yeah. Mr. 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 I'll, just stop, I'll just stop them all, get them off 85 and, <laughs> and win five races on the bounce, then I'd, I don't think there'd have been so much burner no. contention. No, they wouldn't. That, that would have been... Blimey, you know, isn't racing unpredictable? I mean, because because the individual's there, and it didn't help. I think he, he put a tweet out saying, I wasn't there, but, I mean, oh, my God, why do you want to say you weren't there? It's almost like that kind of distancing language that, that people use when they want to try and, you know, get away from something. But, but look, I don't think there's any untoward. I've seen a few times. I think he'd come, jinked and come out the side door, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, going back to betting, though, so betting on TV promoted it, and getting it going in the right direction. John, how can we do this when betting is now a dirty word and it's been encouraged in in the media and, and the wider media and facilitated, in fact, by the BHA, who did retweet gambling harm groups during Cheltenham week, right, facilitated by this, that, you know, betting is, in fact, a dirty word. So how can how how on earth can we then just suddenly start agreeing with these uh, sort of gambling harm groups and then go out and just say, yeah, I have plenty on? You know, we can't, can we? No, not really. Um, it would require a big shift of position. Unfortunately, it's a very necessary shift of position because as racing stands and how it's funded, it can't afford not to shift position. So it needs to maybe look a little bit hypocritical and, and change tack. Chris, the horrific sport of bullfighting, right, still, yep. exi- still exists in España. Now, oh. my, my point is, the reason it exists is because they, and I'm not, I am not defending, I, I'm not a fan no, of bullfighting. No. no, I'm not. I'm just saying that the reason it exists still is because they don't cede to the naysayers, do they? No, 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 they don't. Although, interestingly, bullfighting, uh, you know, because I, I think Mark Prescott is a sort of an aficionado and he's been given a, uh, been not given a novel about it. And, and I think in Spain and, you know, any Spanish listeners we have might want to sort of contradict. I think it's regarded as a cultural activity rather than a sporting endeavour. So, so it's got a very long and lofty place in, in sort of Spanish culture, etc. So it's what it, it's a sort of a, a pursuit that, that people don't criticise in Spain because it's got such a long history and it's, it's part of the sort of the the, the fabric of, of, of Spanish cultural society. So that's probably why it's, you know, uh, what's the word, sort of immune from criticism. As for dropping donkeys off the top of 
fucking church towers, which I think they're fond of in some villages. That's a different matter, isn't it? You know, I'm not sure that's a cultural undertaking. But, uh... well, some villages don't put a bucket of water there, though, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. I didn't know. You should have told me that before I made myself look stupid again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a di- it's a different thing. I mean, it's almost immune for critics because because it's reported in the Spanish newspapers. And again, you know, I'm open to, to be corrected in the sort of the cultural sections that report on sort of art arts galleries and you know book reviews, etc. It's not a sport. It's a it's it's yeah. culture, isn't it? It's, you see, this, this is what the BHA should have done. And, and yes. when they first came a knocking. They should have said, I tell yeah. you what, here's a ticket. Go to a bullfight and fuck off and pester Juan and Manuel. <laughs> yeah, quite quite right. Yes, that's exactly what they should have done. I, I, I couldn't agree more. But but yeah, I mean, so so, so they are more robust in in the sort of criticisms that that you know will obviously ensue for that. But as we've said before, BHA just curl up for everybody that comes knocking don't they yeah don't you, don't you think like society though is is thriving off virtue and oh yeah uh yeah. Especially, particularly online i mean I, I saw your reply chris on a, on a tweet uh regarding oh. the 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 article david carr article on the japanese uh oh, got is there's what, no yeah. no ch- no chinks in in Come equinox's on. armor and then oh, people are making something of that, that it's like some kind of racism or... Well, the Japanese hate the Chinese. They'd be loving that, the Japanese. Christ, yeah. you know. I, I, look, I think I think people, you know, without sort of straying off topic to, to sort of non-racing matters, I think you're right. You know, being a victim is a, a badge of honour now, right? So, you know, in the old days, you know, when you had problems, you sort of kept them under your hat. You didn't want the sort of public shame of being, you know, skint or depressed or your missus has left you. Now, as we've seen with the anti gambling lobby, you know, people are quite happy to come out and say, hey, look, I fucked my life up. You know, my wife left <laughs> me, my kids hate me. You know, I've lost my house. I'm living, you know, on the streets in piss sodden trousers. And everyone's going, oh, aren't you stunning and brave? So there isn't that sense of shame or kind of responsibility anymore. So, yeah, you know, when people are criticising sloppy sub-editing with those headlines in the Racing Post, yeah, it makes them feel good. But the bottom line, Lee and John, is no one's actually fucking doing anything, are they? They're just sitting on their phones. They're not donating their time. They're not donating their money. You know, so what purpose does their comment serve? You know, they're not out there campaigning for, for, for you know, for, for greater awareness of, of of insensitive language. They're just sitting on the phone, making themselves look good, and that's it. Useless. <laughs> Fucking idiot. I'm on a rant now. <laughs> Fucking cunt. I've put them all in the army. That's what I say. Better national service. Do yeah. what my age. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 and this is this this is a problem that going going back to the white paper now. So that's the improvements on betting. Yeah. We 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 basically reversed the BHA. Uh, you know the the pandering to these organisations saying about, about safer gambling it's just nonsense the BHA have just ruined the sport um, but but going back to the white paper so Jeff Banks did a video the other day and you know look Banks isn't everyone's cup of tea I know he isn't but the point is he, he's absolutely spot on on this that that literally the the, the way affordability is going is quite bizarre in that I'll give you an example or Jeff's example somebody can work for McDonald's. And they're on whatever they're on, maybe thousand pound a month or whatever working pot, whatever. And they, they they do the most of the wages in right. So they've suffered harm. They've they've suffered plenty of harm. But that to some people isn't a lot of money. It's like thousand pounds. So if you set blanket affordability checks at like oh well you deposit a thousand, so we'll need to check, right? The point of checking though, and this is where I find this incredible, is that let's say. This is what I do for a living. So they see I've got, I don't know, 30 grand in my account, right? And that's my betting bank. And I say, that's for betting, and that's what I want to put in play. They're not going to let me put that in play because they'll say, there's 30 grand there, you need to live. So we're going to allow you £1,000 a month because you can't play all £30,000 at once. But they don't understand the concept. Well, that's my betting bank. That's what I use or whatever. Do, do you get where I'm coming from? Yeah. The the yeah. And, and what, why can't so so the minute the concerning statements out of the ministry at the moment are things like it only it'll only affect a small amount of people, right? Yeah, so, yeah, but that's a fundamental misunderstanding. That's because they don't understand that there are various types of people that play into those markets. You know, one size fits no one. That that applies to any 
And you've why? got to have stuff that's tailored. And why are they coming out with such statements and using statistical data that are complete bollocks? Like, they're claiming there's more than one suicide a day due to uh, uh, suffering gambling harm. The Samaritans have nonsense this and said you cannot attribute suicide to one single factor. It can be... No. It can be substance no. abuse, family problems. It could be a numerous amount of things. Look, and you're right. Sorry, sorry, just to cut across you, but you're right. Like, it's an important point. And, you know, I've got some personal experience that people I know, you know, people have fucked their lives up through gambling and drugs. But often there is a trigger event which has co- which is nothing to do with gambling or drug abuse that has caused them to go down that path. You know, uh, uh, someone's died, uh, you know, a, a tragic bereavement. And straight away, then they've hit the drugs and they've hit the gambling. So to attribute their, you know, demise or suicide to one thing is nonsense. In fact, it's the, you know, the bereavement that they've suffered that put in, put in sort of uh, that, that those chain of events. But but the, that's what I'm saying. So the, they're not solving anything. They're just causing a massive sort of like national health grift where the National Health Service are now getting involved, wanting absolute bucketfuls of funding to co- to to conquer <laughs> gambling harm. I mean, yeah. this is just Ben. It, it's like, and and where where am I in this? No one cares about me. No one like 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 oh. you said, Chris. No one cares about anybody else anyway. Really, it, really? it's it, it's just a kid. But no one's going to say I'm going to suffer harm if 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 a, if a gambling operator says to me, uh, Mister Keys, um, you can have a thousand pound a month deposits, and I say, well, yeah. on that I can't pay my bills, and then my yeah. family's going to suffer. So I have to get a yeah. new career. I have to do something else. I have to retrain. Yeah. So you've affected my life. Why have you affected yeah. my life? I'm not affecting anyone else's. I hurt anyone else. No. What is this nonsense and and on bullshit data? That's the thing. If it was solid data, I I would possibly have a lot more sympathy. But I, I I'm starting not to because I can see the grift. I can see the people that have submitted to the DCMS, the organisations. They've all they all yeah, smell yeah, blood. They smell the yeah, cash. Money. They can they smell, smell the, the pot. And, and they smell I, I, the money. And, and it's just argument. I've read some of the arguments. It's utter bullshit. Mm. And but people have never had a bet. That's the thing. They speak with such yeah. confidence and knowledge about a subject they have no direct experience of at all. It's so strange to see so many organisations these days have boards job full of people with zero experience or skin in an industry and people say well you shouldn't have skin in an industry because then you'll be biased no it doesn't work like that the what the the bank that went bust in california silicon valley bank was was absolutely full of of people with no investment banking experience why because yeah. they fitted the narrative of of the work agenda that yeah. they were diverse and and inclusive yeah. But had no investment bank experience. Lo and behold, <laughs> they've gone absolutely tits up, and the U.S. government has had to print two hundred trillion dollars to save the banking sector. Now, now, this is this is where we're at. And we've got a BHA gambling commission full of absolute cunts, John. Well, yeah, basically, yeah. But I mean, yeah. Uh, and they'll sit on their hands until it's laid out in black and white, till them that the game's thirty million quid down or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and then you no, get that won't, long, that won't be long. That will happen very soon. That and yeah. then, you, then you get Motter's Ed running an article on why it's all gone wrong. Well, we told you why it was all going to go wrong. Yeah. Well, when Shame you were, about the Titanic, isn't it? It's almost uh, it's, equivalent of that, isn't it? It's That's just great. absolute. I mean, this is where. I mean, yeah. I wish they'd reach out to experienced industry people to speak like we do. To to be, we just say, if I could have spoke on a, on a on a level, probably not how we speak on a podcast. No. But if, I, if if I could have spoke on a level with the powers that be, maybe fifteen months ago, and I'd have forewarned them where this is going to go. But they wouldn't have respected you, Lee. That's that's the point because oh. we not not say me, but the collective we punters like do not fit the preconceived notions of what these people want to be, who these people want to be engaging with. You know, that they are only comfortable engaging with other administrators, other members of quangos, committees, and all these other sorts of rent seekers, you know, because they don't feel comfortable talking to people that actually know what they're on about. That's the problem. You know, civil servants are happier speaking to other civil servants. They don't want to get beyond their own sort of uh, kind of bubble, if you like. Yeah, no, we're we're in dire straits. I'm afraid. I've tried to be positive, but we've gone the other way. <laughs> right, onto onto some final business. 
which is a, a Jimmy Lindley, which I, I, I want to moan about a non-buzzer that I backed on Saturday night, John. Uh, yeah. mid, the dirty Midland Park team. I, and I thought, no, nah, Midland Park, they'll, oh, they'll, they'll, they'll be nice people. They were absolute rotters because uh, the scaffolder and Oshin Orr on blue, blue Yonder in the, uh, in the mile handicap there, the 5.30 on Saturday night, what an absolute disgraceful, blatant piece of complete non-buzzer you will ever see. But I, I urge listeners, like me, keep keep taking their prices. Keep hammering it. They've got a racing club. They've got to train winners. They can't keep doing this. So, so Blue Yonder's ready to win over a mile and beyond. It's just, it li- literally is. They just, they just stopped that for shits and, shits and giggles, in my view. Um, it was no effort from the saddle. Dropped out last way off the pace it just it was it was a disgraceful effort from all concerned i'm amazed that that the stewards didn't have them in for that because it was a fancied runner just never ever put in the race so john anything from your end not at present but i'm sure we're going to get flying as the flat season gets going and this is why again listeners before we finish the show you've got to give patreon at least a go because we're doing the fight that the famed three-year-old five to follow you will not get that if you're not on Patreon because, you know, our work lasts all winter going through these things and we've got the Melrose winner. Between us, we will have the Melrose winner. That's 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 the bombshell. We've got four ten candidates. <laughs> we, we might have a few. We might have the Melrose field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, there's a good chance we'll get half of it. So uh, that will be out on Wednesday. That's myself, John, uh, Jack, Veach, and Quentin Franks. There's four of us this year instead of three, so you gain an extra five to follow. There'll be other mentions as well, and we're also going to be looking at first season sires. So this is a, a, a podcast not to miss, and that will be available on Wednesday evening at some point via Patreon. So we hope you've enjoyed this sermon. Uh, we certainly have, as always, me, John, and Chris. We always give it an absolute blast. That's all from us. Bye for now.